Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox Reviews and thank you for logging on. As ever, all you see here is for sale, but in a little bit of a wrinkle, today half the watches on the table are coming attractions not yet listed on our site. You'll see in the description below the names, the references, and the prices, with the exception of those that we have not yet posted. For those, email tmasso at thewatchbox.com, which is your purchase and pricing email. For your questions about buying these or any watches you see here on Watchbox Reviews, our website, or our social media. And for the first time, I'm going to pick the watch I most want from the table right at the end. Let's jump in with some heavy metal. Well, technically stainless steel isn't heavy metal, but the 2015 Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Silver Snoopy, technically the Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Apollo 11 anniversary piece is, uh, pardon me, Apollo 13 anniversary piece is an absolute showstopper. A watch launched back in 15 that immediately became Omega's only answer to the ceramic bezel Rolex Daytona. This is a timepiece that is simply groaning with clever features that make this stand out from any other Omega limited edition. Now the Apollo 13, we're going to turn it over right here, features first and foremost a hand engraved sterling silver Snoopy on the reverse of the case. That is applied to a base which is made of vitreous enamel paint in a lovely cosmos blue with metal flakes inlaid to create the stars. This is the Charles Schultz Snoopy as drawn for NASA, the Snoopy being an award for distinguished service by equipment providers to the Apollo program. Now it's important because the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch in pre-moon form was actually used on Apollo 13 to time the firing of the maneuvers and the thrust periodically to re-enter the atmosphere, re-enter orbit, and ultimately save the three-man mission. Now there's a little bit more here. As you can see, it is a limited edition, and I'm going to show you individual numbering. Out of 1,970 pieces in stainless steel, you can see the Snoopy with a lovely three-dimensional vault and depth to him. Now you turn it all over. I mentioned the firing of the engines to regain Earth orbit and ultimately re-enter. And you can see that there are 14 comic style slides. So these are comic strip style frames over 14 seconds because the primary use of the engines to regain orbit took 14 seconds as timed with an Omega Speedmaster. You'll also note that the indices on the dial have three dimensions to them. They are applique rather than printed. They are solid blocks of superluminova, three, three dimensional. They have height, width, and length, so they actually tower above the dial and they glow on the dial at night. If you look very closely next to the 14 frames that represent the firing of the engines, you could see it asks, what would you do with 14 seconds? You have the image of Snoopy himself, uh, and then you can see it actually says failure is not an option, which is a line from the Apollo 13 movie, but we're going to include it as part of the theater here. Now there's also a ceramic inlay for the tachymeter rather than the usual anodized aluminum, and the full tachymeter is loomed. So the individual indices are loomed and three-dimensional. Snoopy on the dial is loomed inside the constant second sub-register, and then of course the tachymeter is also loomed inside a caliber 1861 manual wind cam lateral clutch moonwatch caliber, still used by NASA today, and the timepiece with a 48 hour power reserve beaten away at 21.6. Throw it on the wrist. You can see that there is a hybrid textile contrasting stitch and calfskin strap, as well as a full deployment clasp, which you will not find on a standard steel moon watch. There is a sapphire crystal over the dial because this is an upscale special edition. The Apollo 13th timepiece, of course, handsome in the way a moon watch is handsome, but with a very different look because of the white. Not silver, but true white to the dial the hottest Omega watch of our era, and the one that is still in demand, one of my personal favorites, and if you like our old Versus series, one of the best ever features featured this watch. Now, jumping into something that's a little bit more accessible, but also true to the period, this is yet another Omega Speedmaster Professional. This is the Mark II. The Mark II was launched in 1969, the year of the moon landing, and it was intended originally to replace the Speedmaster Professional, which was, I guess, unofficially the Mark I. So this was designed to replace the 145022. This is a 145014 stainless steel. The watch is 42 millimeters wide by 45 millimeters lug to lug and about 14.7 millimeters thick. This one is remarkably intact, though designed in the 60s and launched in 1969. The shape is really of the 70s, as it was a harbinger of design trends to come with its highly techno lozenge-shaped cushion or tonneau case. You can also 
also see that it's a little bit of a transition piece as it does feature a tritium dial, but rather than the plexiglass of the standard, or Hesalite, I should say, of the standard moon watch, we have a mineral crystal with the tachymeter actually printed on the underside of the mineral crystal. Tritium hands to match a tritium dial, no oxidation, moisture, or markings. Moon watch caliber inside, 861, closely related to the one in the silver Snoopy. Few changes, one, one less jewel, a different finish with a sort of copper style finish rather than the rhodium of the silver Snoopy today. And the watch is entirely intact. As you can see, even the sunburst radial graining that emanates out from an imaginary center point at the center of the dial, applied with a lapping machine, it's still present on the top of the lugs as well as the mid case. You'll also appreciate the fact that this watch is a monoblock style case as everything loads through the back. You can see that the case and the bezel are integral up on the front. The timepiece featuring a remarkably easy fit on the wrist because it is only 45 millimeters from lug to lug. Although it never replaced the moon watch, it has a special place in the hearts of Omega collectors who often strive to collect the original Speedmaster Professional, the two, the three, the four, and ultimately the rare five. So you're well on your way with this piece. A great way to jump into to vintage Omega. Omega Mania continues, and it continues in the form of one of the most agreeable, in my opinion, most special modern day Omega Limited Editions. Not another Speedmaster. In fact, the Bullhead is a Seamaster. This is the Omega Seamaster Bullhead Chronograph Rio Olympic Games Limited Edition of 316 pieces. Literally 43 millimeters wide by 43 millimeters lug to lug. It has an unconventional shape. The Bullhead returned to us back in 2013. Always a limited series in its modern iterations. It looks back to the days, I believe, of the 146011, the original Seamaster Bullhead. Now, what you have at the base of the dial is a crown for adjusting the internal rotating bezel and you can line up the luminescent triangular index with the minute hand and you can time something with the bezel even as you use the chronograph which includes a nifty stopwatch style bullhead control system that makes it easy to use in the hand. Timing Olympic events? Why not? Or the kids track meet? Or fish tacos on the grill? It doesn't matter. Every event is the Olympic Games when this watch is on your wrist because it's just that much fun. It's a rare joy, like the Olympic Games themselves. You can see Olympic colors on the dial, white dial, black applique indices. You can note a blue matte finished inner rotating bezel. You have Olympic colors on the strap, which is remarkably elaborate as you have the sort of tangerine orange. You have a deep blue turning it over to its opposite side. You have both green and red. It's an unusual strap being entirely rubber coated externally, but it is leather at its core. So it has a leather core with a rubber coating that makes it super slinky and super smooth and supple on the wrist. There's a full deployment clasp, trigger actuated, as you can see, twin trigger. So you pop it open, there's a minderless system inside, so you don't need minder loops on the strap. All excess length tucks underneath. It's also 150 meters water resistant. And because it's only 43 millimeters lug to lug, you can see it sits quite easily on the wrist, compact to the point that I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 13 centimeters in circumference. I don't often say that of a 43 millimeter watch. Inside, you've got a caliber 3113 coaxial and COSC chronometer. It features a vertical clutch and a column wheel. Stop seconds, a quick set date. It features a free sprung architecture for shock resistance and a 52 hour power reserve. It's based on a Frederic Piguet 1285. So at its heart, it is a high horology movement related directly to what you'll find in Blancpain chronographs, a very special piece that I happen to adore. We're sticking with our Omega theme here and we're going with one that is rarely seen on the show. The Omega Constellation Globemaster, stainless steel and tungsten on a full bracelet. No one needs another Royal Oak and Nautilus ripoff. And back in 2015, Omega was ahead of the curve, coming up with this original design, handsome, from the inside where it emulates the 1950s pie pan constellations to the outside where it emulates the 1960s sea case constellations. It is a full integrated bracelet sports watch, 100 meters water resistant with a nearly indestructible tungsten carbide coined bezel to take up the bumps and bruises of daily life on the wrist. As you can see, the blue sunburst dial is an extraordinary three dimensional feature of the watch, handsomely balanced with applique indices, Omega logo and marquee. Turn it all over, and you can see inside we had the first of the 
master or metas chronometers. You have the image of the observatory on the case back to remind us that the original constellation was an observatory qualified chronometer back in 1952. And when you turn it over, you can see it beaten away at 25,200 vibrations per hour, 60 hour power reserve, twin barrel, free sprung balance with a full bridge for shock resistance. It has a silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism. And being a metas chronometer, this 39 millimeter all around men's watch is extraordinarily resilient not just in terms of shock resistance and water resistance, but it is also effectively amagnetic to the point that it can encounter anything from a particle accelerator to an MRI. And while you might be stuck to the MRI, the watch will be working just fine. Easy and comfortable to wear on any wrist. It's narrow across the forearm, making it suitable for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference, a truly special watch with a 60 hour power reserve. And finally, for those of you who love your Omegas, but you want just a little bit more of a sporty, demeanor on the wrist. Here is one step up from the Globemaster. This is the Aquaterra, the Seamaster Aquaterra, 41 millimeters in diameter. This is the post-2017 model with the no guard profile and of course the date down at six rather than three. It also features lateral teak deck rather than the previous vertical teak deck. And you can see it has a lovely sort of chrome blue dial that catches the light and scatters it handsomely with all applique indices, logo and marquee. In here we have another example of the caliber 8900. So I'm not going to go too deep into this other than to mention that if you look carefully, I'm going to try to show you the case back, but if you look carefully, it is mechanically identical. You just see a little bit more of the movement because of the absence of the observatory at the center. This is 150 meters water resistant and a little bit better loomed. So if you want to somewhat, I've got some original manufacturer's packing stickers on here that are holding the watch hostage. But if you want something a little bit sportier, then the Globemaster, this is it. A lovely piece on the wrist from a great brand that'll be around forever to service it. High technology, traditional horology, and a great look that'll wear well on a small wrist. I highly recommend the 41 millimeter steel Aquaterra. Now let's go high horology. Let's go sky high horology with something that completely shifts gears. In 2015, Vacheron Constantin launched the Harmony collection. The next year, they launched the Harmony Mono Pusher Chronograph in rose gold. And that is this watch. 42 millimeters across by approximately 51 millimeters lug to lug. The watch is just over 13 millimeters thick, and it is an ornate mono pusher chronograph with a doctor style pulsation gradient scale. So it's used for gauging the pulse of a patient over the course of 30 pulsations. You'll also appreciate the first quarter 20th century design, as Vacheron was working extensively with tonneau style cases before the round case crystallized as the dominant shape in the wristwatch market, which was still emerging in the 20s and had by no means con already conquered the pocket watch sector. So this is a tribute to the early Vacheron watches. There's a power reserve down at the base of the dial for the 65 hour manual wind power reserve. And as you can see, there is a coaxial mono pusher integral with the crown. Now I stop and then I reset, and I'm gonna flip it over and show you the case back because this is where things get intense. This is the Vacheron manufacturer caliber 3301. As you can see, Geneva Hallmark, five position adjusted, free sprung with a Breguet overcoil hairspring beaten away at 21.6 with a lateral clutch and a column wheel. You'll also note the completely freehand engraved golden balance bridge. As you can see, it features a banknote style hand laid scrolling, much like what you'll find on longer watches. A broad open movement that makes it easy to see everything. Nothing is disguised and kept from your eyes, including the crenellated tops of the black polished column wheel, which feature a Maltese cross at the center. As you can see, because of the lateral clutch, you get to enjoy all aspects of the operation of this watch. You see the column wheel, the levers, the horns, the reset hammer, and of course the fully jeweled lateral clutch. As good as it gets, and again, 65 hour power reserve, mono pusher, a crisp column wheel action, and Geneva hallmark for both the watch and the movement. Throw it on the wrist, and it is imposing. If you don't need to go swimming with your big watch, then I would recommend this over a Royal Oak Offshore as you're getting something that is truly scarce. This watch, by the way, is a limited edition. And you can see, the limited edition numbering, let me try to show you if I could find it. Limited edition numbering 
for the 260th anniversary of Vacheron, as that was the launch year of the Harmony Collection. So 260 pieces of this watch, individually numbered. Although again, 260 would have been 2015. This watch was launched in 2016, making it a very special modern day Vacheron Constantin. We're sticking with the high horology theme and we're talking about Patek Philippe and a different anniversary. 175 years of Patek back in 2014. And this is the 5975G001. 400 pieces in white gold. It is a triple scale chronograph that has a tachymeter, a doctor style pulsation meter, and a telemeter. The three scales, telemeter for gauging the distance, for example, of an artillery impact. This one has its roots in the military science of the 19th and early 20th century. Then you have the pulsation scale for the doctor, and then you have the tachymeter to gauge the speed of an object between, for example, the start and the stop of a flying kilometer. Now the watch is a flyback chronograph, but you'll note it features only seconds on its dial, with a central chronograph seconds hands that effectively acts as the seconds hand for the watch. So you have your seconds, your minutes, and your hours at center. You have white gold hands, applique indices, a lovely silver dial base, and an opaline frosted finish and you can just reset the watch though it doesn't feature hacking seconds once you set the time reset that flyback second system to synchronize and now it effectively does have a hacking and zero reset system 55 hour power reserve automatic winding ch 28520 movement internally vertical clutch and a column wheel so with the vertical clutch you can leave the thing running with no additional wear and tear solid case back so you have that commemorative Patek Philippe 100 and 75th anniversary text as well as the interval itself and it does make the watch thinner than if it had a display case back You'll also note the strength of this case and the lugs as there's an almost buttress like profile to the stepped lugs and a handsome and sharp Conical profile to the flank of the case Patek Philippe case making and this is gray gold or white gold That's white straight through but Patek case making has come along by leaps and bounds in recent years It is now among the best in the industry after tentative and somewhat, I, I would say, evolutionary designs in the 80s and 90s during its early days of case making. Today, it's best in the business. As you can see, the watch is low slung on the wrist at 40 millimeters, a perfect size, and with only 400 made, you'll scarcely see any more. A very, very, very special watch that I happen to adore. Now, speaking of a brand I adore, Jager Le Coult of Le Sentier, Switzerland, is my original love. And I still have my Memovox, my vintage Snowdrop E877 in the collection. And in 2018, I was present to see the birth of a new model line at SIHH, the JLC Polaris collection. And this is the Polaris Automatic Date. 42 millimeters in stainless steel, it is a dive watch based on the super compressor case design of the original 1968 Polaris diving alarm. Well, this one is stripped down. It doesn't feature the alarm. It's a bit cleaner of dial and of crown profile. You can see it has that internal rotating bi-directional diving bezel, fully loomed. It features the sort of patina loom style that was only featured on the Polaris Memovox and the Polaris Automatic Date in that series of 2018 Polaris. So this is a bit of an unusual dial with that Fotina. It is a handsome and warm look inside a 42 millimeter stainless steel case that nicely echoes the case and lug profile of that original Polaris 68. 200 meters water resistant, it has a JLC manufacturer movement caliber 899 inside, which is a free sprung unidirectional winding update of the well-known and much loved 889 high horology automatic. As you can see, it features a integrated strap profile that conforms to the flank of the case and means that there's no daylight between case and strap. The strap is also nice and thin and supple. So though this is a large watch at 42, it easily wraps around the edge of my wrist and I can recommend it for a wrist as small as four 14 centimeters circumference. As with the original Polaris 68, you have the image of the diving helmet on the back. The case is no longer made by Irvin Picarez as they were in the early days. They are now made in-house by Jager Le Coult, a very handsome watch. And my favorite detail here, the box section sapphire that echoes the lines of the original plexiglass. A very thoughtfully executed watch and a great way to dive with modern style without any of the concerns about durability or water resistance that come with a true dive watch. Sticking with Jager Le Coult, La Grande Maison of the Vallée du Originally the watchmaker's watchmaker, building a Bausch and completed movements for everyone from Vacheron to Patek Philippe with Audemars Piguet in between, but today JLC principally known for keeping its best for itself. And in 2006, it launched the Amvox 2, the second in a series of chronograph, alarm, tourbillon, and 
chronograph world time watches inspired by Aston Martin cars. It's important to note that from the 1920s through the 1990s, Jaeger dashboard instruments were featured in Aston Martin cars. So this was a bit of an inversion. The first time the Aston Martin logo, which is ghosted onto the base of the dial, featured on a Jaeger instrument rather than the other way around. So this is real history, not astroturfed. 500 pieces in blackened DLC titanium were made, and they're featherlight 44 millimeters, the DLC proving tougher than conventional PVD, as most that I see of that 500 piece blackened run have absolutely no marks on them whatsoever. Here too, you have a box section sapphire designed to evoke vintage plexiglass, and you have a function selector that can lock out the chronograph, lock out the reset, or enable all features. And how does this work? Well, it features a pivoted case. This is a chronograph with no pushers, take note. It is a pivoted case that pivots on ball bearings. You can see the hammers of the chronograph system at the base. And as I stop and start, I do so by pressing at the top of the crystal. You can have the discs for the minutes and the discs for the hours, and they light up in the dark. And you can see I reset just by pushing the trigger, which is the base of the dial. Also cool, automotive inspiration. You have the partial calibration from eight to four that you would have seen on a speedometer. After all, the bottom of a speedometer or a tachometer not calibrated, and that's the look you have here. You also have the image of an Aston Martin vintage gas cap with the crown profile, and on the reverse side of the watch, you will note that the embossed pattern on the leather is carbon fiber, as with modern Aston Martin cars. You can see the reverse side does feature the famed Aston Martin winged logo, as well as a combination of media blasted and vertical satin and finished surfacing with individual numbering in the series. You can also see the three parts of the case, one, two, and three, that allow it to pivot on the wrist. Now I'm gonna throw it on the wrist and show you how this thing actually fits. It's super smooth and seamless on the wrist. Activating the chronograph is a crisp experience thanks to a superb column wheel. It's a vertical clutch, it's a manufacturer automatic movement with a 65 hour power reserve, and of course it's been through the master 1000 hours control. A lovely detail, uh, Andrew's gonna get real close to the dial here. You can see the Calypso style hands that were controversially fitted to a few Italian market versions of the old Polaris 68. So quite a few references to JLC's own history on this watch and comfortable to wear at only 50 millimeters lug to lug across the wrist. I love this watch. I owned the titanium version without the black DLC and it was probably my favorite single watch. This thing is a gem. Now let's stick with the titanium watch theme, but go with something that's a little bit newer, a little bit younger, a little bit more, shall we say, experimental. A watch launched in 2017, this is the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Automatic. It won the 2017 GPHG Men's Watch Prize, and you can see why. 40 millimeters with a Gerald Genta inherited design, it has a 5.15 millimeter thickness thanks to a movement that's only 2.23 millimeters thick. All in titanium, it's feather light on the wrist. And I should mention that when it inherited that design from Gerald Genta, it inherited the Octo form that debuted back in 2000. So it's not a Genta the man design, it's a Genta the brand design. And you can see the movement inside BVL 138, 55 to 60 hour power reserve platinum micro rotor. It beats away at 21.6 and remarkably, not only is it only two and a quarter millimeters thick, but it's 36 6.6 millimeters wide, so it properly fills the case back. Bulgari making its dials, its movements, its cases, its bracelets, and its clasps a fully integrated manufacturer to an extent that not even Audemars Piguet can boast. This is a remarkable watch in every regard, including how it fits on the wrist. As you can see, it's flush and almost, no, truthfully, it is lower than my wrist hair. Flat and limpet-like. It will fit underneath any cuff, and though it can be used as a dress watch, it's also sporty. Dress it up, dress it down, long sleeves, short sleeves, male, female, big wrist or small. Because of the integration of the bracelet, it has an imposing look without actually being a huge watch. It's a 40 that measures about 46 millimeters lug to lug, but it has the look of a far more substantial piece. The finish on the movement is exemplary, and Bulgari is going places. The best things happening within LVMH watch divisions at Bulgari, and of course, Bulgari independent from Tag, Hublot, and Zenith, they're doing everything right. They're taking care of themselves. They've pulled out of Baselworld because they realize that's not where the action is. Making their decisions independent from the other brands has liberated Bulgari, especially the watchmaking sector of Bulgari, and helped to establish it as a legitimate luxury brand. Now let's talk about 
a timepiece that is in a lot of ways related to the architectural and faceted design of the Octo, but this one is a little bit Genta and a little bit Emanuel Get. Of course, Gerald Genta creating the original 1972 Royal Oak and in 1993, Emanuel Get, then I believe 23 years old, created the Royal Oak Offshore. Well, this is a model that debuted at SIHH in 2018, and it's the Offshore Diver Olive Green. You have a green gloss lacquered mega tapisserie dial, 42 millimeter stainless steel case, and 300 meters of water resistance. You can see inside the case back, Audemars Piguet manufactured caliber 3120 with a 60 hour power reserve and a bi directional rotating. 22 carat gold mass, not 21, not 18 carat, not tungsten, 22 carat, with the coats of arms of Audemars and Piguet Blazon, reminding you that AP is the oldest continuously operating Swiss brand still in the hands of the founding family. Throw it on the wrist, and this one features the diver strap that many offshore chronograph owners have already retrofitted. It's more comfortable, it fits better, and whereas this watch on the hornback alligator can be downright daunting for a smaller wrist under 15 centimeters, on the diver strap it is far more aggressive. Agreeable. A watch with an internal rotating bezel just like the Polaris. It features a crown up at 10 o'clock that unscrews and then allows you to ratchet the bezel by twisting it. And you never actually have to remove your hands. You line up the luminescent index with the minute hand and now you've got a zero to 60 minute count up timer that I actually find more intuitive than a chronograph and you don't get the downstream maintenance expenses that come with a chronograph. I really like this watch, but then again, I'm a huge fan of green timepieces and believe it or not, this is not the only green timepiece on the table, nor is it my favorite. Speaking of Rolex, when we speak of color, we need to admit that Rolex dials oftentimes have a little bit more of a sense of fun and adventure to them than the brand's stolid and downright stodgy image at times would suggest. But we've got dials like the Milgauss Z Blue. We have the D Blue in the Deep Sea Collection. And of course, we have the 116622 Platinum and Steel Yachtmaster with sunburst metallic blue dial and red shock accents. 40 millimeters in a case that is considerably more elegant than the Sea Dwellers, Subs, GMTs, or Explorer 2s. This is a wonderful watch and a great example of a contemporary Rolex that's priced fairly honestly on secondary markets. There are markups, but they're not huge. There's a bit of price inflation, but nothing unsustainable. And when you throw it on the wrist, I defy you to tell me that that isn't just as much fun as wearing a sub, that it doesn't look just as good as a GMT or a Daytona. This would be my preference among the three, as the Yacht Master has an entirely different demeanor, character, and ambiance about it. With a bi-directional rotating yachtsman's bezel made of solid platinum on a stainless steel case, this is a timepiece that can be worn everywhere for any reason and by anyone. The grace of the case, the thinner profile at under 12 millimeters thick, gives it an, a leg up on the Submariner in elegance, even as the richness of the dial and the bezel give it a little bit of a premium prestige that you won't find on a Rolex dial. Mechanically, of course, identical to a Submariner. It's 100 meters water resistant. Now, for those who want to go with the greatest hits, I recommend something discontinued. And the Daytona 116520 certainly is that. This is the pre-ceramic bezel. This is an F-series watch made in 2003. 40 millimeters black dial, stainless steel case, matching bracelet. Uh, this timepiece is 12.2 millimeters thick and 40 millimeters in diameter. And again, no super case here. It's not a GMT, a sub sea dweller, or an Explorer 2. So it has a lot of grace in the case profile. And you can see that the Daytona and the Yachtmaster cases are actually quite similar to each other in terms of how they look and how they contour. So I find that favorable over the squared off and blockish cases that arrived with the GMT in 2005. Throw this one on the wrist, it's imposing. If I had to choose between this and the ceramic bezel, I'd probably choose this as the timepiece has an all of a piece look with the stainless steel bezel that is broken up by the presence of the cerachrome. The cerachrome is more scratch resistant. This seems a little bit more organic, flowing, and natural. So you have to pick what your priorities are, but mechanically they're identical with a three-day power reserve, automatic winding, chronometer certification, of course, a vertical clutch and a column wheel in-house chronograph caliber and 100 meters water resistant with or without the ceramic bezel. So this is a ton of timepiece. And again, a discontinued example 
Daytona markets are kind of crazy right now, and I can't tell you for a fact that they're not going to come down a bit. But if you want to protect yourself a little bit, buy something that's discontinued. Either go with a Zenith Movement Daytona or go with one of the pre-2016 steel models, especially the black dial, which I prefer for its strength and its power, its punch over the conventional silver or white dial. I would also say that if you want a Rolex that represents better value than just about anything else, Daytona, Yachtmaster, you name it, you have to consider the 2005 to 2014 Cellini prints. Based on a Rolex design from 1928, the original Art Deco era prints, this is the 54419. Like all of the Prince models, it features a case and dial design drawn from that metropolis era when the machine ethic was finding its way into everything from household appliances to dirigibles to skyscrapers to aircraft to trains and even cars. Remember the Chrysler Airflow? This is a watch that is remarkably cohesive in white gold. As you can see, it has the circular Gaudron pattern. Those concentric straights on the center of the dial, but also outboard of the two dials. You can see the Gaudron straights again on the white gold case, and it's gray gold, so it never needs to be rhodium plated. It's white gold straight through Rolex, making not only its own cases, but also smelting its own gold alloys. Now you turn it over, and you can see caliber 7040. This is 7043, I believe. And you can see how the movements of these display case back Rolex models featured the same design as the dial, as you have those circular concentric Gaudrons, or strikes across the surface of the movement. This was the first Rolex movement ever designed to be seen. Manual wind, three-day power reserve, and chronometer certified. This watch was also the first Rolex timepiece to be serially produced and fitted with a sapphire display case back. It is very special. Throw it on the wrist once more, and you can just see that because it's not terribly long, lug to lug, it's only about 45 millimeters, any wrist size can wear this watch. And if you don't want your friends, your family, or your work associates to show up with the same Rolex you own, buy one of these. Originally priced close to $20,000, they now sell well under ten. dollars So when I talked about value in modern Rolex, this manual wind display case back Art Deco chronometer is as good as it gets. You're getting a ton of watch for your money. Give me that over a Patek Calatrava any day. Now let's talk a little bit about watches on straps because we've been running the table on bracelets. I want to talk about a timepiece that represents probably the first dress watch from Carl F. Bucher we've ever had on the show. This is a 2017 limited edition of 188 pieces in steel, and it is numero un. It is the first watch. It is number one. 42.4 millimeters. This is the Monaro gradient dial power reserve day date limited edition. You can see it has a gradient dial, a fume style, that fades from bright metallic green at its center to almost black at its edge. 42.4 millimeters, it's only 12.7 millimeters thick, and note this, first time I've ever seen it, there is a gradient fade to the strap on both sides. As it's lighter at its periphery than it is at its root where it abuts the case, it actually fades inversely to the dial, lightening up as you move away from the dial. The case is elegant and handsome, and this is a manufacturer watch. Power reserve, 55 hours, quick set date, both directions, the date and the day. Stop seconds, 21.6 beat rate, and the CFB A1000 manufacturer peripheral rotor automatic. You can see the rotor rotates around the movement rather than blocking the case back. So you get the thin profile of a manual, the open case back of a manual, but the convenience of an automatic and a great one. This movement featuring possibly the most elaborate fine adjustment mechanism I've ever seen on a regulator. This movement cost Carl F. Bucherer money and reportedly they lost money on everyone they made because of the development cost and what a pedigree. It was created by THA, an engineering house and a movement specialist founded by Vianney Halter, Denny Flachoulet, and F.P. Jorn. They sold the company, ultimately, the last partner involved sold the company to Carl F. Bucherer, and that's where that movement came from. As good as it gets, and easily the coolest green watch I have seen, and one of my absolute favorites, a watch I'm considering for myself right now. Let's jump back to 2011. This is the Panerai Radimir Oro Bianco PAM 376, 47 millimeters, white gold, a true plexiglass crystal, just like the original 1930s 3646 California dial watches that inspired it. You can see it's a California dial with Roman numerals on the top and the Arabic numerals on the bottom. 100 meters water resistant in spite of its white gold construction. It features a three-day manufacturer caliber 3000 through the case back 
and the timepiece on the wrist has impressive heft. This 501 piece limited edition launched back in 2011 is a special series Panerai and a special sight on the wrist comfortable because of its spare wire lugs. It effectively measures as a square on the wrist, 47 by 47, and it has a nifty feature. You can see the screw down crown. Remember, the original Panerai 3646 watches were built by Rolex for Panerai. Panerai fitting the dials and making its modifications, but the original watches were oyster case, and this Rodimer case pays tribute to those. There is a stepping hour hand for the three-day power reserve manual wind movement that allows you to change if you are traveling, and the watch allows you to step the time zone without disrupting the minute hand. A lovely piece and very special with significant heft on the wrist. Now we're jumping to a timepiece that I think represents something close to the best value in high horology chronographs. If you're not going to buy a JLC Duomet, get the original 39mm Alango Unzona Datagraph. 39mm, platinum, sterling silver dial, black galvanized, a flyback chronograph that you reset and restart with a single push. There is also a trigger that allows you to quickly and easily cycle the double digit date. Awesome on the wrist. It has impressive heft. Again, not big at 39 millimeters, but with a platinum case and a sterling silver precious metal dial, you do feel the mass. And you can see the class of caliber L951. When launched in 1999, this is the movement that forced Patek Philippe to essentially reconsider its finishing standards and get off its doff and start developing some serious in-house chronograph calibers with finishing to match. This watch, probably more than anything else, ushered in the end of the Le Mania era at Patek Philippe. Manual wind, overcoil hairspring, 18K beat rate. As you can see, lateral clutch and a column wheel with a flyback action. It is beautifully executed with a combination of satin silver finished steel chronograph components and that golden hued German silver, nickel, copper, and zinc with the copper giving it the golden hue. A very special watch and one of the finest of the modern era. This is part of the pantheon of the modern day gods, or to use DC's term, the new gods. Very special watch. And continuing our run of special watches, we're taking a look back to hallowed antiquity. A timepiece launched last year in 500 pieces. This is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Barracuda, named after a German market piece built by Blancpain during the 1960s for the armed forces as well as on a limited basis, civilian divers. The watch is 40 millimeters in stainless steel, and as you can see, it features that vintage-inspired Fotina dial with a bezel to match, and just like the 5015, this 40.3 millimeter steel watch includes a cambered sapphire over the bezel, so it's fully loomed and also highly scratch resistant. On the case back, well, you can see through the case back, that the watch includes a movement, caliber 1151, that is exclusive at this point, as all of the modifications done by Frédéric Piguet, now manufacture Blancpain, make this effectively a different movement than when it was first conceived. It now features a free-sprung balance and a silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism, as well as a 100-hour power reserve beautifully hand finished with many different finishing styles from media blasting to satination to engine turned perlage to Cote de Genève with black polished screw heads. It is a special movement for a special watch, beautifully executed and with the entire timepiece only 40 millimeters in diameter, a viable alternative to a Rolex with so much more craft, horology finish, low volume appeal, boutique brand and real historical mythos appeal. This is a watch that has a lot going for it, from its look, to its history, to the brand that makes it, to its limited run, to the fine finish inside and out. There's nothing I don't like about this watch. That said, it's not my favorite on the table. Things are getting intense now, as we have a watch. Oh, let me just show you the crazy watch. <laughs> I, the Daytona, the Cosmograph Daytona, is the winner's gift at the 24 Hours of Daytona. If there were a 24 Hours of Dubai, this would be the winner's gift. This is not my pick among my favorite watches on the show, but it is certainly the first example I've seen, and maybe the last I will see, is the 116599, all white gold with sapphires and diamonds. Simply boggles the imagination. If you want a modern-day handmade Rolex, you have few options, but the gem set pieces are handmade and handcrafted crafted par excellence. As you can see, the dial has been paved. So too have the center end links of the strap. So too has the bezel. And as you can see, the timepiece, still a 40 millimeter white gold watch, 100 meters water resistant, three day power reserve, mechanically identical to a Cosmograph Daytona. This is a timepiece that is outrageous and wants you to embrace 
the sheer level of outrage, the let them eat cake, fatuous arrogance of this timepiece on the wrist, and in white gold with blue accents, both the sapphires as well as the Roman numerals, I do dig the color combination. It features a matching gloss navy blue strap. This is a timepiece of extraordinary character for an extraordinary character. If you're that guy, you already know this watch is for you. I guarantee the soulmate for this piece is watching right now, Team Asso at thewatchbox.com. Now, jumping further into my favorites, this is the watch I would pick. Of all the watches on the show, this is the one I want. A 2013 limited edition from Zenith. It was a boutique exclusive. This is the Captain Windsor annual calendar from the El Primero line, 40 millimeters in stainless steel. It features a precious metal, smoked fume style palladium dial. Silver at its center, a sort of silver bronze at its edges. It fades from that bright silver to dark at its edge, but not radially. From top to bottom, you can see there is a thin band of shimmering silver at the center with the Ludwig Oxlin annual calendar system that you will find on Ox und Junior watches, albeit here for a lot less money. Nine pieces, and it is a system adjusted using the crown, so you can actually adjust it using a quick set. An annual calendar, it need be corrected only once per year during the jump from February to March. March. It has an El Primero chronograph caliber, caliber 4054 through the case back. It is a 10 beat per second, 36,000 vibration per hour, 52 hour power reserve, El Primero movement. It features a column wheel and lateral clutch, and you can see them both in action underneath the case back. This watch has it all. Throw it on the wrist. The strap is actually rubber coated on its underside. Alligator leather on the top, rubber on the bottom. It wears wonderfully. Compact across the wrist. You can see there's plenty of clearance. There's wrist to spare on both sides. So even if your wrist is as small as 14 centimeters circumference, you're going to wear this one well. I adore this watch. Even the calendars are printed in blue. I love everything about this watch. Do not buy this. That one's for me. Now, the most spectacular watch on the show. And this one had to cap the episode. Launched in 2018, 39 millimeters in red gold, 20 pieces manufactured. This is the H Moser and C Venturer Concept Blue Lagoon with a fume dial that explodes from an iridescent turquoise blue at its center to almost black at its edge with a purity style dial featuring leaf style red gold hands and nothing else. You could see the sleek case with a bubble like sapphire atop and hollow evacuated lugs with satin finish for contrast in between. A signature Moser shape. Turn it over and you have a manufacture movement with a three-day manual wind power reserve beaten away at 18,000 vibrations per hour, free sprung with a full bridge for shock resistance with a hidden case back three-day power reserve indicator and extravagant double crested Cote de Genève. You can see the twin strakes of the distinctive Moser double crested Cote de Genève satin finishing across the bridge as well as the crown wheel. It is the best I can do today. Aesthetically, it has no equal and everything right down to the hairspring, the balance, the escapement built in-house by Moser. Throw it on the wrist. I love the kudu leather strap. And if you have to Wikipedia to see what a kudu looks like, then you're exactly like me. It sits low. It sits flush. It sits red hot, hot enough to leave an impression on my wrist. This is smoking stuff with no vanity or branding or self-aggrandizing advertising on this dial. Supreme confidence and style from Moser, the other vertically integrated manufacturer of Schaffhausen, which builds only 1,500 watches a year, of the which this is one of just 20 in this series. A very, very special watch and the best I can offer you today. Team also at thewatchbox.com. Half these watches are not on the website yet. You get the first dibs by contacting me right here. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew. I got Sean and Andrew on the switcher and the camera today. They did a great job. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.